What's up, everybody? Welcome. Episode 560 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fadden here with a special guest, Ryan Finley. He is the sports editor for the UT. Uh, January 31st, 2024, almost to February, almost to the month that pitchers and catchers report to spring training. Pretty close here. Can't wait for that. There's finally been a move by the Padres, and so we'll get into that. Uh, but Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate the time. Hot Lava Podcast, co-hosting there with Kevin Ac. They will be back um, here next week. And then obviously great UT coverage for the Padres all season long. And we'll get into some other stuff about the UT and their plans for 2024. But I right. first want to just start off Padres-wise, Ryan, uh, just your overall thoughts on this offseason so far. Are you surprised by what has happened? Um, do you like the direction things are going? I, I assume that not a lot of fans like the direction right now. Yeah, you know what? I'm surprised and I'm not, right? On one hand, you know, we've been reporting, Kevin was reporting a year ago, like around this time, that the plan for the Padres was to cut payroll. Uh, starting in 2024, that, that there was the anticipation that they were going to lose some guys in free agency, which is what happened, um, that you know they were going to try to replace them with big league ready, uh, league minimum kind of players. And, and so, yeah, am I surprised that they're not spending money? No. Um, I would also say that it's probably a little too soon to talk about what they have and haven't done because I am of the camp that they're going to do something. Um, I like find they it have very, to. They have to. I mean, you, I'm not sure that, you know, Jose Azokar and Fernando Tatis are, can cover three outfield spots, um, you know, by themselves. And so, you know, you know that there are going to be more moves coming. Um, so I guess I would give them kind of an incomplete at the moment. You know, they made a move earlier today um, that I think is kind of in line with what they've been doing uh, so far this offseason. I think that that speaks to their strategy. Um, maybe we, we we can get into the move. Yeah, Wandy Peralta, let's get into that right now. So sub-3 ERA the last two years, really mm -hmm. big ground ball rate, over 50%, like for the last five seasons. Mm -hmm. Lefty arm, you add that to Yuki Matsui yeah. and Tom Cosgrove. Like, I like that. I like where the bullpen is at. But mm -hmm. I was surprised by this move because I thought yeah. that the Padres were pretty good bullpen-wise. Like, there's still guys that aren't going to be in the rotation that can contribute to the bullpen. I'm not saying I don't like Wandy Peralta, like adding him specifically, but I was just surprised. Right with them on a budget, obviously, and now they're spending four-plus million dollars a year, on AAV-wise at least, on mm -hmm. Wandy Peralta. So were you surprised by this move? Do you like this move? And do you think that they're allocating the resources in the right way right now? I think you're probably going to give the same answer, like it's incomplete still because we don't know exactly how much money they have to spend, mm -hmm. how much are they going to spend it on, who are the players that they're going to spend it on. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I I, I don't dislike the move necessarily. I, I think... I'm more intrigued by what the move tells me, okay? This move tells me that rather than going and trying to get an elite frontline starter or or overpay maybe for one of the free agent starting pitchers that's out there, that A.J. Preller is making the conscious decision to try to shorten games as much as he can, right? That, that if their four and five spots are going to be question marks, and even if they go get one player, you know, I mean, they, there's no guarantee that that Darvish and Musgrove are going to be a healthy, b as effective as they've been in the past. Um, to me, this just speaks to their strategy of, you know, really trying to shorten up games, trying to um, really work that bullpen uh, and, and see if maybe they can steal a couple, so to speak. Um, I'm not yeah, Peralta. I mean, it's uh, it was surprising to me only, like you said, because. You know, they seem to have so many bullpen arms and especially a couple left-handed arms. Uh, my mind immediately went to, hey, what does this mean for Adrian Morahone? Um, Adrian Morahone's a guy who you know, maybe you can't rely on him year in and year out because he seems to be injured a lot. But he is a hard-throwing left-hander who would have slotted right in in like the seventh inning if they decided to make him a bullpen guy. And that's exactly what Peralta appears to be for the Padres now. So um, I guess my next question would be, A, uh, is Adrian Morahone in their minds, maybe a, a starter or a fringy candidate for one of those open rotation spots. Um, B, if he's not, and maybe it doesn't look like he's going to make the bullpen either, is he the kind of player who, who you might see traded? 
um, those were sort of my, my general thoughts on it. In terms of the Padres offseason so far, you know, I, I don't think that you can ever judge an offseason in which you trade Juan Soto as a success. Uh, that said, this is a new world we're living in. And, and given the the players that they got back for Soto, I mean, imagine how many holes th- this pitching staff would have had the Padres not acquired essentially four pitchers for Juan Soto. Um, imagine, you know, yeah, they spent, what, $4 million AAV uh, on Peralta today. Imagine if they would have had to go get another veteran backup catcher instead of, uh, you know, the relative bargain they have in Higashioka uh, from the Yankees. So, um, you know, the Soto trade, I understand it addresses a lot of holes, um, but, you know, it also creates a giant hole in left field, and the Padres have yet to address that. And the how did we get to that point, I think, is what frustrates a lot of Padres fans. I wanted to hit on that Adrian Morahone thing. That's interesting because I was thinking in my head today, I haven't like done any video or anything on it. But yeah, because there's a lot of guys that are going to be fighting for the bullpen spot and then rotation. And then the Padres, they've tried year in, year out. I kind of compare it to Anderson Espinosa. I know he never you know, was at the big league level with the Padres like for a long period of time. I forget sure. if he ever debuted i know he's with the cubs um but they've tried they've tried and is, is this the time to cut bait and i look at someone like joe adele who mm-hmm. the padres they need outfield help i know he's not a left-handed hitter but talent can you get something out of him the angels they don't have any options on joe adele so is that like a late spring training thing where they the angels want to keep adele in case injuries happen uh you know mickey mm-hmm. moniak what's his future going to be like but if everything's good and they feel like, hey, let's, you know, we we think we can get something out of Adrian Marhon. And if he stays healthy, I mean, we win the trade then. And maybe that's how they think about it. Um, mm-hmm. And they just say, hey, with Adele, we're not going to have him on the roster. So might as well. Um, that's something that immediately sticks out in my head. Yeah. But yeah no, and that's really clever. Gonna be, it's going to be an interesting spring training here with Marhon. I think he's one of the guys to watch for sure. Yeah. But Joe Adele, too, is the kind of player that, that AJ Preller. Uh, prizes right this is the kind of guy who aj preller traditionally or at least the aj preller we know from the last 10 years goes after aj preller loves loud tools more than anything else and very few young players in baseball have louder tools than joe adele you know you worry about the limited productivity that he's had as a big leaguer but you know what you could say the exact same thing about adrian Mm morahan and so if you're looking to line up maybe you could go hey how about this guy for this guy the classic change of scenery move you hope that uh, that both players would benefit from a different situation and maybe just a different set of eyes on them. Um, that said, I'm not sure Joe Adele can be a starting outfielder on a playoff caliber team, right? And and you know maybe you put Adele in sort of the you know, maybe you have Adele and Azokar battling for a roster spot, or maybe you know you sort of turn it into one of those. Hey, somebody's DHing every night. And that would make some sense. You know, uh, Kevin Acey was on a, a separate um, broadcast earlier today and and made mention of the fact that uh, somebody like Tommy Pham would mm-hmm. have some interest in a reunion with the Padres. And I know that he can be a polarizing player, but to me, he makes a ton of sense. Or somebody like him, right? It doesn't have to be Tommy Pham. But maybe Eddie Rosario. Yeah, Eddie David Rosario. Peralta. Yeah. The, David, the fact that David Peralta, that it's 2024 and he hasn't been a Padre yet, is a little bit of a surprise to me. Um, yeah. You know, he's exactly, you know, David Peralta, you need a left-handed bat. You need somebody who's a veteran big leaguer. Um, he would make some sense. You know, you put him in right field. He's got a good arm. He DHs a couple days a week because, again, he's kind of on the older side and maybe you want to keep him fresh. Somebody like Tommy Pham, you know, maybe you give him a one-year deal. You pay a little bit more than you thought you'd want or thought that you would for him. Maybe you say, hey, like, you know, one year, seven or eight million dollars you give him a chance to build another case to hit the market again this time next year, you come in under whatever your, uh, your budget artificial or not, that is Um, that would make sense. I think that they are more likely to end up with one of those veteran guys who may not have the loud tools, but somebody who you can depend on as opposed to taking a flyer on somebody like Adele. Um, I'd like to see both happen, but I, I think that the veteran guy is probably the safer play for a team that considers itself a playoff contender. Yeah, and that's obviously free agency, someone like David Peralta, Eddie Rosario, Tommy Pham. I'd be shocked. I was saying this earlier today. I'd be shocked mm-hmm. if there's not a trade just oh, because yeah. of the free agent market and how many 
players, I mean, arms that are just out there for this Padres team. That you, you want arms in spring training, obviously. Like, you can never have enough pitching, but maybe they can use that to their advantage. And why sign Wandy Peralta? Maybe, well, maybe there's a move that we're not thinking about that's mm-hmm. coming down the chute here in a trade that then it maybe would make a little bit more sense. Um, but we'll see. Eric Kutsenda, are you frustrated with him not speaking yet? What's your level of confidence in him right now? He's the Is that interim, that's an incomplete, probably. It's too. an incomplete. He's yeah. the interim control person. I have no idea how long he's going to be in charge. Um, they have not made they've made no promises about how long he's going to be in charge. I, I think before I could tell you whether or not I'm disappointed in him, I would need a little bit more clarity as to how long he's going to be around. You know, my understanding. And what they have, I think, said was that this was going to be a temporary deal, but that the long-term plan was to keep it within the Seidler family. Um, In that regard, you know, maybe it could send us just here for the winter, or maybe he's just here for a season. Uh, You know, Kevin AC reminded me of this, and it's nice to get a little perspective from him on it. Because, again, I've I've been doing this job at the UT for one year, Mm -hmm. right? You know, Kevin goes, you know, owners don't just talk in other markets, right? right. In, in many ways, I think that we in the media and Padre fans have been spoiled a lot by Ron Fowler and then Peter Seidler, uh, two guys who, you know, some years, I think probably because there weren't great baseball players who could get out and, and be the voice of the franchise, came out and, and would say, you know, they would do interviews and they would talk to the fans directly. Um, that's just not where we're at right now. Um, I think that if you know, we've come to find that, say, a member of the Seidler family is the new long-term control person. I, I think that they would do more talking. Um, but for now, I think Kitsenda is kind of a, a placeholder um, until until we know more. And and again, it's January. I'm not necessarily going to – I wouldn't hold that against the Padres any more than I would hold a lack of moves against the Padres because I don't think we're seeing the whole picture just yet. Yeah, and you, you talk about other owners around baseball. I mean, look at the Red, the Red Sox. They're – what we're seeing here with the Padres, Eric Grubner talking a little bit publicly this offseason. Red Sox, they just have Sam Kennedy go talk, and Tom Warner and John Henry, they never talk to the media. Like, that's just right. some some pe- Steinbrenner with the Yankees. Sometimes he talks a couple times a year. Some guys, you just don't hear from them. And so maybe right. it's a personal choice thing, but also, like you said, interim chairman, it makes sense that he hasn't talked yet if there's right. plans behind the scenes or – He's just going to talk at spring training and then we'll actually be able to confirm that this isn't like a AI, um, you know, photograph that we're all that seeing one, that one that, photo that we've seen. One headshot. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's funny, you know, I, I'm going to, I'll ask you too, you know, how much talking did Ron Fowler and Peter Seidler do in the months of November, December, and January? Uh-huh. Not a whole lot. Right? right. The thing that I seem to remember over the years was there would be one day at spring training where you would trot out, Fowler and Seidler, Fowler, you know, and then later Seidler, and they would do kind of the, the, the media day thing at spring training. You know, I know we have a hundred photos of, of those two guys over the years standing in front of a spring training backdrop, talking to the media, but that was generally the first time that they would sort of address the media in the new year. And so um, again, who knows, maybe Kitsenda comes out early in spring training and talks, maybe the Padres announce a new plan. Um, you know, that wouldn't surprise me either. I'm sure that there will be more questions about the long-term ownership situation as we get closer to the Peter Seidler Memorial, which I know will be coming up here um, before uh, the Padres' first game at Petco Park. Um, and you know, maybe we'll have a better idea then of what the Padres' long-term plans are. What are your expectations for this 2024 season for the Padres, regardless of what moves they make this offseason? Like you could say, well, Ben, I, I want to wait until I see what other moves they make. Right. But at the same time, like, I think our expectation should still be, you know, make the playoffs here. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's yeah. not like this should just be a rebuilding year because, oh, they traded Soto and Hayter and Snell aren't here anymore. Waka, Lugo, Martinez, like, it, they still have a lot of talent on this team and guys that could come up and be impactful players. Right. I, by the way, I'm drinking. I don't know if you see this for those watching. Ah, uh, Travis out of a Travis Jankowski the podcast cup. listeners. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Travis Jankowski giveaway cup. Totally just the first thing I pulled out of my, my cupboard here at home. Um, the expectation is playoffs. Now, now let me give you a little background on me. Okay. I'm a native San Diego. Grew up in Del Cerro. Um, uh, worked when I was 16, 17, 18 at Qualcomm Stadium 
is a peanut guy. Okay. Went to probably 20 games a year my entire life until I started working at the stadium. And then I went to all of them. Okay. Um, I, I have a different perspective. With all this team's flaws, this is still the fifth or sixth best team on paper that the Padres have had since I've been born, right? Since I've been alive. I mean, 84, 98, uh, you know, three times in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. That's it, right? This is maybe like, let's say sixth or seventh best team, you know, with the roster as we know it right now. Um, my expectations is that this team finishes 500 or above. And if they're 500 or above, they're pushing for a playoff spot. I'm not one of those guys who says, you know, look out LA. I mean, I think that, you know, the Padres or the Diamondbacks, I'm sorry, the Diamondbacks this last fall have proven that there's more than one way to get to the playoffs and there's more than one way to get to the World Series. And it doesn't necessarily start with toppling the LA Dodgers. The Dragon Slayer stuff was fantastic. And again, I was in the stands that night. One of, well, hands down, my favorite sports memory ever, yeah. right? You don't need to slay the dragon to win the championship, right? You don't, right. you don't. There are ways to win a championship without slaying a dragon. The Diamondbacks got into the playoffs, what, three games ahead of the Padres, caught some breaks. Yes, they beat LA, which is great. Caught some breaks and they ended up playing the Texas Rangers for a world championship. You know, three games different. Maybe it's the Padres doing that. Um, and maybe that's a little too optimistic on my end, but I think that this is a team that, that the expectation should be bare minimum 500, challenge for a playoff spot. The Seidler family, I still think that the Seidlers would would sign off on adding players at the deadline if the Padres are still, or, or if the Padres are competitive. You know, the expectation here yeah. is to me, second place or better in the National League West. I still think that they're on paper better than the Giants and Rockies. I, I don't believe necessarily that the Diamondbacks are, uh, you know, the Padres should cede anything to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, so that's my expectation. I don't know about yours. Yeah, for me, I mean, right now, I don't care what else is going to happen this rest of this offseason. I'm, I'm postseason. That's my minimum expectation. Uh, and, well, maybe what I should say is expectation is that they contend for a postseason spot. What I won't right. accept is them not making the postseason. And if that doesn't oh, happen, yeah. then, I mean, I think fans think that Preller should be gone already. but if and some think that he should be here through 2025 to see out the the prospects and him and Schilt Schilt's last year under contract uh, as the manager and they should see it out regardless but I mean the track record it, it's got to speak louder than any relationships and oh yeah prospects coming up well guess what a new GM could come in and those prospects are still going to be coming up it's not like the prospects right. are going to leave with AJ so we'll see sure, well, yeah go ahead. I, I, well, and we can all agree I mean I think that AJ Preller has proven, if nothing else, that he's very good at turning draft picks into prospects. Yeah. And that, you know, that that's the thing. But that's if he were the scouting director, he'd have job security for life. But he's the president of baseball operations, which means you're responsible for not only that, but the trades you make, the moves you make, the moves you don't make, right? And and the the way you delegate power. And you know, to me. I, it's going to be so interesting to me to see the sort of what a Mike Schilt managed team plays like yeah. um, to see, you know, Schilt sort of, I was at the press conference. Schilt got my attention when he talked about doing the little things right. And I know that it's a baseball cliche, but if had the Padres done the little things right last year, they would have made the playoffs because you need to win three more games mm -hmm. and a little bit better base running, uh, a little bit better situational hitting winning a one or two dang extra inning games over the course of a long season, um, they would have made the playoffs. And so it'll be fun to see, fun to see how this year's team plays. Yeah. You know, win five games in a row, four, four games, was it four or five? Four was the number, right? That they didn't get to till till the very end. Right. Till the very end. Yeah, they, they didn't win an the, extra. The Rockies and the A's. Right. Well, and they didn't win an extra inning game until the last week of the season. Right. Because they beat the yeah. Giants. Uh, um, White Sox or Giants? Yeah. Whatever. Giants. I think it was, I think it was, yeah, maybe maybe it's the White Sox. Um, it, yeah, but you know those are the things, right? And you know, I'm a huge baseball guy. The, the reason why I like baseball better than all the other sports is because over the course of a very long season, if you do things right, things that require very minimal talent, that if you play smart, um, good things happen. The best team rarely wins the championship in baseball. It's the teams that execute the best and the teams that play the best down the stretch. 
And, you know, I think the Padres have that in them. You know, I, I, I love watching Juan Soto play. Um, I, but I understand why they traded him. And just from a financial standpoint, if you're not going to re-sign him anyway, you know, uh, I don't know. This year's team still has Xander Bogarts, Fernando Tatis, Manny Machado, Joe Musgrove, and you Darvish. Um, I think the expectation has to be the playoffs. Yeah, and Hassan Kim for now. We'll see. We'll see what happens there. How did I leave Hassan Kim off that list? He's like my <laughs> favorite guy to watch. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. With and you talk about AJ Preller a few moments ago. If things don't go well, that next team that he goes to will be very fortunate because he's not going to be the GM of that team. He will be the scouting director or something of that team. And that team will be very good prospect wise. I mm -hmm. probably can assure you that probably be the next Baltimore Orioles with all those prospects that they have, because he is good at that. Like that's, that's definitely proven. Um, let's get to the UT. Um, yeah. Before we get to that here, episode brought to you by Gaglione Bros, famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries. Main location is on Friars Road. Best cheesesteaks and garlic fries in San Diego, without a doubt. Um, at Petco Park, inside Snapdragon Stadium. Link in the description with all their stuff and all the other partners of this show as well. So let's just give a preview of 2024 Padres coverage in the mm -hmm. UT. Obviously, Kevin AC. Great work as the beat writer there. Um, and then obviously Jeff Sanders and all the other guys yeah. that contribute. Um, what are the plans? Still same Padres daily, hot oh, lava. Yeah. Give it all to us. Yes, 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 yes. We've been on. It's so funny. I had somebody ask me yesterday. They said, when the hell are you going to do a hot lava again? And you're right. It's been a while. But, you know, it's been. Unfortunately, we have said, hey, we'll do them when there are big offseason moves. And, uh -huh. yeah, you know, um, so we're going to uh, resume hot lava next week. Uh, Kevin goes to spring training um, the day before the Super Bowl and uh, gets started there. We will continue to have the Padres Daily Newsletter. We will continue to have the Hot Lava Podcast. Kevin, Jeff, you know, uh, Bryce Miller, yep. Tom Krasovic, um, all those guys. So, uh, so yeah, it's great. You know, one of the things, and again, I've been in this role for about a year. You, it's mostly just tweaking in terms of what we're doing differently because Kevin and, and Jeff are both so talented um, and complement each other so well, right? You know, Ke Kevin can write. I don't know if you've read it, but if you haven't, uh, and to your listeners, stop what you're doing, take a half hour out of your day and read Kevin's story uh, on Mike Schilt. Amazing. Um, yeah, Absolutely from, amazing. Yeah, it, it's the longest story I'm I'm certain that has ever run in the UT. <laughs> it's yeah. a long, it was Shield has but, a long career. A lot of Shield stories. has a long career, and Kevin sends me the story. He had you know gone to North Carolina, hung out with Mike Shield, gotten to know some of Mike Shield's people. Um, sends me the story, and you know my job as an editor is to take stuff and and sort of whittle it down to the best stuff. And even after I did it, it was the longest story. I think I've ever run as an editor and, and I wasn't going to cut any of it just for the sake of it being shorter, because these are the kinds of stories where if you subscribe to the UT, we want to do more of, right. Um, you know, we sent Kevin to the Dominican Republic uh, two months ago, hang out with Fernando Tatis, check in on him uh, when he was playing in the winter league, Mike Schilt just happened to be there. Um, you know, we sent Kevin to North Carolina. We send Kevin, we send Kevin to Korea. Um, these things cost money. And, and I think, you know, if you're not subscribing to the UT and if you're a Padre fan, you're missing out uh, because uh, the Padres daily, which is free to everybody, mm -hmm. but also Kevin's uh, daily Padre coverage. In addition to stuff from everybody else is great. And, you know, depending on when you're listening to this, I'm sure we have a deal. I'm sure we have a digital subscription available. If you go to union tribune, San Diego or San Diego uh, union tribune .com. Yeah. Um, uh, you can, I'm sure that you will find a, a, a digital offer um, that you can afford. Um, it's the best deal going. So uh, yeah, no, I'm really happy. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, talking about Kevin for a minute, you know, in the last year, you know, Kevin's really been writing about some really sort of heady stuff. You know, it's, he, he wrote about Manny Machado and all the issues there. He wrote about uh, sort of the, the festering relationship between uh, Bob Melvin and AJ Preller. And, you know, those kinds of stories he only wrote because he's there every day and very few people in the, the Padre media sphere are there every day. And, you know, that's, 
that that's so important in our profession uh, to, to be around these guys and, and then to write these stories when you can, because again, Kevin has all these examples that he's witnessed uh, traveling with the team every day. So again, anything you do to subscribe, help support our work, help support our Padres coverage, and certainly would be greatly appreciated, not only by me, but by Kevin. Yeah, for sure. And I always try to, you know, post a little interesting tidbit from an article, you know, with a link and check yeah. it out because, you know, Kevin, that, that, and I send him messages whenever he has those amazing pieces like that, like the Mike Schilt piece. I mean, there's, so you didn't cut anything from that. Hardly any, um, okay. hardly any. He, I, I told him, I called him, I said, you know, I'd like to tell you that, that we should cut this in half, but I don't know where I'd start. And yeah, it's, you know, the, the detail in it, I just love, uh, you know, when he talks about, you know, the name of the guy who ran the snack bar at the stadium in Charlotte where Mike Schilt worked when he was nine. The fact that Mike Schilt remembers that guy's name, right, I think tells you everything you need to know about Mike Schilt. Um, my favorite takeaway, and maybe it's just because I'm a, 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 a media guy who spent a lot of time in those press boxes, but, you know, when Mike Schilt was a, was a boy, you know, he was the one guy in that press box in Charlotte who never missed a, a pitch. Right. Yeah. When, 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 when Kevin tells this great story with, within his story about, you know, at some point the guys in the press box got to talk and, and they looked over and somebody was at first base and none of them knew how they got there, how the guy got there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this little squeaky voice from the corner goes, you know, he walked and, you know, it was Mike Schilt because Mike Schilt never missed, missed a pitch. Um, and again, when you're talking about the kind of guy who can get the most out of a baseball team, when you talk about the roles of a manager in the year 2024, you have to be a little bit of everything. And Mike Schilt is that, um, you know, in one way, he's very old school in another way. He's, he's not, he's very holistic in his approach. And uh, we'll see if, if he makes a difference uh, compared to Bob Melvin. Yeah. All right. Let's move to, from the Padres. I want to move to some of the other uh, San Diego sports here Yeah. for, let's say, let, let's go, let's start soccer here first. So San Diego mm -hmm. wave, obviously MLS, Mm -hmm. What is the plan there for 2024 and beyond? Obviously, MLS coming for real in 2025. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan of assigning a specific writer to cover all of soccer or bring in someone all of soccer or just what how it has been here? That's a great question. Um, we have a, a, a reporter who is, for my money, the best soccer writer I've ever read, and that's Mark Ziegler. The problem is Mark Ziegler just happens to cover San Diego State. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is which is San Diego State and men's basketball, which is a really big beat here too. So, again, stay tuned on that. Um, you know, I think that uh, we may. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do it yet. Their season doesn't start for another year. Mark's doing all of the run up to their inaugural season and doing a heck of a job. He had a story in Sunday's paper about the Right to Dream Academy and, and how this folds into the new MLS expansion team. Um, which is really good. And so we expect more stories like that as we get a little bit closer. Um, Tom Krasnick does the bulk of our San Diego wave coverage um, and does a really good job with it, you know, approaches that this is a guy who's covered the Padres, who's covered the Chargers, who's, you know, I was reading a story today, Tom Krasnick's story from the day Tony Gwynn got his 3,000th hit. He was there, you know, to have that experience on a beat like the wave is invaluable. And so we'll see. San Diego, at least in my mind, um, I think they're still looking for that sort of one B or number two uh, franchise that everybody can get behind. Right. Mm -hmm. I think everybody here can just kind of agrees that they're Padre fans, right. Because it's, it's San Diego's one sort of major professional sports team. You know, I think that gosh, San Diego state basketball is right there. San yeah. Diego state football, if they got hot or, you know, if they were more interesting to watch and they might be under Sean Lewis, you know, maybe there's a chance there major league soccer, the wave, I mean, the wave, it was so disappointing to me when the wave lost in their NWSL semifinal match at Snapdragon. Cause I thought that had they just won that match, regardless of what happened in the championship, I think that that really would have been their chance to capture the San Diego market. There was nothing going on in the city of San Diego that what September, or October um, Padres had not made the playoffs. Um, and Snapdragon was hosting the championship game. Um, that would have been a real chance. Um, but I love the fact that San Diego's all in on soccer. Um, it is a smart soccer fan who lives in San Diego too, because they watch a lot of it. And so um, you know that MLS and the wave too are going to constantly push themselves to, to put out a good product. And, and that's a good sign. Yeah. In 2024, by the way, I think the wave have another opportunity, a huge opportunity yeah. because they're the only soccer club 
outside soccer club in town. So it's a big opportunity there this year. All right, I want to end on NFL Chargers. I am someone <laughs> that uh, has the belief or the opinion. Mm-hmm. I ask the question every time I see it. Mm-hmm. Why are the Chargers being covered in the San Diego Union Tribune? Yeah. Why is Nick Canaba putting out Charger grades like they're still playing in San Diego? Why are there NFL articles being put out when we're in San Diego? That's just my point of view. Feel free to give your thoughts on that. Sure. I, I would counter that there are less than there have been. Um, that one of the things, and again, it's it's complicated. I mean, the answer is complicated. I get two complaints, okay? Complaint number one, why do you cover the Chargers so much? Complaint number two, why don't you cover the Chargers more? Those are the two complaints I get. Every Monday, I will get an email from somebody saying, I'm so, I, I you know, uh, why are we running Nick Canepa's grades in the paper? And then I'll get an email from somebody else saying, I watched three hours of the Chargers yesterday. I don't understand why there isn't more about them in the paper. Which um, one's which one's easier to answer? Because for me, the easier one to answer is uh, because they're not in San Diego anymore. That's why we're not writing. Yeah. Now, I would argue, though, counterpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I agree with you, by the way, in terms of if I take off my sports editor hat and put on my San Diego native hat, um, I have not cared how the Chargers did since the day they left. Okay. I don't root or I don't root against them. I, I don't wish bad things for them. They cease to matter to me. Again, just as a San Diego native, mm-hmm. they cease to matter to me when they move. Okay. Um, but I think that we can agree that they're both the most beloved and the most hated team in San Diego right now. Don't you think? Mm, most hated, yes. Beloved, I feel like. I don't know if I'd say that with the Chargers. I feel like you got to put that the Padres with that. No, no, no. I'm sorry. NFL team. NFL. Yeah. Yes, oh. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. NFL yeah. team. Okay. Of I course. think that if we're talking yeah. NFL, right? I mean, yeah. there are more Charger fans here than Packer fans, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, in that regard, there is an obligation to the segment of our readership that follows the Chargers to run some Chargers stuff. Here's what I'm not going to do as the sports editor. I am not going to let coverage of San Diego sports suffer to put more time or resources into the chargers. I'm just not that to me, that doesn't make any sense. Chargers don't play here. Right. Um, that said, I understand that there's an audience. I mean, our statistics, our metrics show, you know, Nick Canopus charger report card does really well. Uh, there's no option when you read it online, whether you're love reading it or hate reading it, right. Sure. Whether, whether you're reading it because you want to see how many F's they got, or whether you're reading it because you're a fan, there's no sort of way to parse that. Um, but you know that's that's sort of the situation. Um, you know, I again, it, it, our Padres coverage, our Aztec coverage, our soccer coverage, will never suffer because of the little compared to what we used to do coverage of the Chargers that we have. It's you know, it's Nick doing a report card that he's done for decades, and it's Krasovic periodically writing about them, and uh, that's basically it. Um, but yeah, the Chargers are tough. You know, I, I go, I'll speak to groups every once in a while. And, you know, it's the first question. First question is either, you know, why, uh, what's with the Chargers? Why don't you do more on the Chargers? Or why do you do so much on the Chargers? So um, I don't think that you can get a room full of San Diegans to agree about the Chargers. And, uh, you know, I'm in charge of putting out a, a sports section for the whole city. So it's tricky. Yeah, there you go, San Diegans. If you want the answer, there you go, from the sports editor himself. Very right. complicated, but it's a complicated answer, right? I mean, yeah. it's I, it's it, it's tough because, again, as the sports section, and then I'll, I'll save you my yammering. Um, as a sports section, we do have an obligation to our readers to provide them with, with, st- with stuff that we think is important to them, right? Are the Chargers important to all of our readers? No. Um, but if you asked all of our readers who their favorite NFL team was, I think the Chargers are. And so you can't just not cover the NFL because they moved. The NFL is the most popular sport in, the, in America right now. Um, on the other hand, there's no reason to cover a team that left just as much as you used to because why do that? So Yeah, so. right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, fun conversation. Ryan Finley, sports editor, San Diego Union Tribune. Great Padres coverage coming up this year. Last year, I thought it was great as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely appreciate 
all of the time, the resources into that and other San Diego sports as well. Uh, I'm personally, I'm hoping that there's more wave coverage this year, especially with, you know, 2024. That's the team um, mm -hmm. this year. We will see what happens. But yeah, Ryan, thank you so much. This has been episode 560, Talking for Hours podcast and YouTube show. Have a great night, everybody. And thank you so much for tuning in. Definitely appreciate it. See ya.